Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Beforehand on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. This is a very special episode for me personally because... Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World began five years ago. Episode one on Ghost was released on Friday, August 10th of 2018. And in the years since, the podcast has grown. And today we're regularly in the top 25 documentary podcasts as found on Apple Podcast Charts. And we estimate that we have more than 100,000 listeners per episode. And with a listenership that big, some listeners will have had mysterious experiences. And some of you have even contacted us and shared their experiences. And Jimmy, who is a certified uh, as a paranormal investigator, has helped some listeners figure out what could explain the mysterious things that have happened to them. To celebrate our fifth anniversary, Jimmy decided to ask uh, listeners to send in their mysterious experiences. And boy, <laughs> did you all respond. And on today's show, we'll be presenting you with a selection of them. So what have Mysterious World listeners reported? What does Jimmy make of their experiences and what could explain them? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, what do we need to say to begin? Well, the first thing is that our listeners report having a lot of mysterious experiences. We only actually made the invitation to send them in twice because I was concerned about getting overloaded with experience reports. But wow, did people respond to just those two requests. When the written accounts, and we also had recorded ones, but when the written accounts were put into a single document, it was around 80 pages long, single spaced, and it would take four to five hours just to read it. Then, as I said, on top of that, we had experiences that were sent to us in audio and video formats. If I were to comment on each of the individual experiences, it could perhaps double the length of the episode, depending on how much I said. And I don't think that the audience is really up for a 10-hour episode at the moment. So to keep things at a more manageable length, today we'll be presenting just a selection of what listeners have reported. But don't worry, I have read all of the experiences that have been sent in, and I'm saving the ones that we don't cover today for future episodes. I even have ideas about episodes where we might use them. So this is likely the first in a series of mysterious experience episodes. You're listening to episode 300 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about your mysterious experiences. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. As I said, today's episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is a special one. It's our 300th numbered episode, in addition to all the bonus episodes that we also release. And so Jimmy decided to celebrate by looking at more of your mysterious experiences. What have listeners of Mysterious World reported happening to them? What could explain it? And what does Jimmy make of the experiences? Well, that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, where did the experiences that we're going to be talking about on today's episode come from? Well, as we heard in the beforehand segment, uh, when we were coming up on episode 271, our fifth anniversary show, we asked the listeners to send in accounts of their mysterious experiences, and wow, did they ever. Um, we had so many people send in experiences that, that there was no way we could cover them all in that episode, so I saved the ones that we didn't cover for future episodes, and that's where the experiences we're talking about today come from. They were sent in by our listeners a few months ago in the run-up for the fifth anniversary, and even today, we won't be getting through all of the ones we currently have, so we'll be doing more Mysterious Experience shows in the future. In fact... Uh, as we're getting ready, as we were getting ready for this one, it occurred to me that a lot of people are likely to have experiences that they haven't sent in yet, but would like to, uh, including experiences from new listeners who weren't part of the audience back in episode 271. And I wanted to create a good way for the listeners to send in their experiences that also included a good way for me to find them in the future, because if they all got sent in to feedback at mysterious.fm. 
it's like which of these are feedbacks and which of these are experience reports. So I talked to you, Dom, and we set up an email address just for people who want to send in their mysterious experiences. So if you have an experience that you'd like to report, you can send it to experience at mysterious.fm. Once again, that's experience at mysterious.fm. And that way, I can just uh, search on messages sent to that email address to find the experiences, and that'll be much easier than trying to identify them from among the numerous emails that are sent to our feedback address. So once again, if you have a mysterious experience you'd like to report, don't send it to feedback. Uh, Be sure to send it to experience at mysterious.fm. That's experience at mysterious.fm. And we'll repeat that address at the end of the show. Is there anything we need to say before we start looking at the listeners' experiences? Well, just one thing, uh, because many listeners will be interested to hear what I might have to say about their experiences. I will be commenting on them. However, I need to explain how I'll go about doing this. As we said last time... Many of the people who sent in their experiences expressed a desire to hear what you would have to say about them. Do you plan to offer your own thoughts? I do, at least briefly, but I should give a couple of notes to explain my approach. Uh, First, I wasn't on the scene during or shortly after these experiences, so I haven't had a chance to do a formal investigation of them. And as a result, I can't come to any definite conclusions about the experiences, but I can offer a few thoughts. To begin with, I can usually say what category the experience belongs to, at least based on what is reported and how it appeared to the experient, that is, the person who had the experience. Often, people are helped by just knowing what category an experience falls into. I also may be able to comment on how common or uncommon the experience is reported to be and what some of the possible explanations for it are. This includes both normal and paranormal explanations. If I were doing an actual investigation of these experiences, I'd make a list of every likely possible explanation, starting with the normal natural ones, and then I'd work through them one at a time, like we do on other episodes of Mysterious World. For time reasons, among others, I won't be doing that on today's show, and I won't list every possible explanation, but I will say If this has a paranormal explanation, here's what it sounds like it would be. I also uh, may list some possible natural explanations, but I won't attempt to be exhaustive. So with those notes in mind, here's our first experience. It comes from a listener named Anne. I am a retired family doctor and would like to share with you the greatest miracle I saw while in practice. It has totally natural explanations and may not be the kind of miracle you are looking for, But the number of coincidences in this event are really quite extraordinary. When I was a resident, I admitted an elderly woman through the emergency room. She was unconscious, and when we did our workup, we found that her condition was terminal. There was nothing we could do to save her life, and she would not wake up again. I called her sister, who lived in a distant city, and shared the sad news with her. I asked her sister if there was anything I could do for the family, and assured her that we would see to comfort measures for her sister. Though it was my habit to ask about spiritual needs of the patient, I forgot this time. The patient's sister, however, did not forget. She shared with me that she and her sister were both raised Catholic. While she had remained in the faith, her sister had stopped practicing her faith some time back. She asked if I could perhaps find a priest to give her sister the last rites of the church. I didn't think that would be any problem, since the hospital in which I was training also had a chaplaincy residency program and we often had priests in the building. I had forgotten that it was a Sunday. The floor nurse worked hard at calling several nearby parishes, but no priests were available due to their busy Sunday parish schedules. I was disappointed since I did not expect the patient to survive until Monday. A few hours later, I went back to check on the patient and review her chart. I flipped the progress notes open, yes, they were still paper charts, and found a note from a Catholic priest stating that he had seen the patient and given her the sacraments. I asked the nurse how this had happened. The nurse told me that she was sitting at the nurse's station and saw the elevator doors at the end of the hall open and a Catholic priest walk out. To her surprise, the priest walked off the elevator and into the patient's room. She went in after him and found him standing at the foot of the patient's bed. He had come to visit the woman who had been in that room, in that bed, until her discharge that morning. 
The nurse explained that the parishioner, who he had come to visit, had gone home, but the woman at whose feet he was standing needed to be anointed. The nurse, who was Christian but not Catholic, and I were convinced that God sent that priest specifically to this woman at the time of her death to call her to eternal life with him. I still get tears in my eyes when I think of this. It gives me so much hope for all those who we love who drift away from God. I have seen that God loved this soul and found a way through his priest to bring her back to him. I believe this was nothing short of a miracle of God's great love and perhaps a sister's prayers. Thanks, Jimmy and Dom. I love your shows. I am a science nerd and a serious Catholic and love hearing about the intersection of faith, reason, and science fiction. May you live long and prosper here, then live forever with the God and his angels and saints in heaven. Thanks, Dr. Ant. That's a really great experience. I'm so happy that the priest showed up and was able to give the patient the last rites. Uh, in terms of the category that this type of experience would fall into, as you may know, it's what's known as a synchronicity. Uh, this is a term that was introduced in the 1950s by the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung. Uh, synchronicity is an experience in which two events that have no apparent causal connection happen together in a way that is meaningful. In 1973, Jung reported what is now considered the classic illustration of a synchronicity. Here's a summary of it from Psychology Today. A young woman of high education and serious demeanor was being treated by Jung. Jung could see that her quest for psychological change was doomed unless he was able to succeed in softening her rational shell with a, quote, somewhat more human understanding, end quote. He needed something to help transform her. He remained attentive to the young woman while hoping something unexpected and irrational would turn up. She was describing a dream from the previous night about a costly piece of jewelry in the shape of a golden scarab. He heard a tapping on the window. Jung opened the window and plucked a scarabid beetle out of the air, the common rose chafer, Satonia orata. Jung commented that the beetle, contrary to its usual habits, had evidently felt an urge to get into a dark room at this particular moment. The beetle, closely resembling the golden scarab, was just what he needed and just what she needed. Here is your scarab, he said to the woman, as he handed her a link between her dream image and the external world. In that case, the two apparently unrelated events were the woman's dream about a golden scarab piece of jewelry and then Jung hears a noise at the window, and it's what looks like a golden scarab trying to get in. In your case, the two events were the need of the patient for the last rites and the arrival of the priest to the very bed of this patient, even though he was there to see someone else. And, you know, they were apparently causally not connected because he was there to see someone else. Another way of thinking about synchronicities is like this, is that they're kind of divine coincidences. I've had such coincidences myself, including in connection with the death of my late wife, Renee, and I'll share that story someday. I've also had many other synchronicities that I can talk about. Uh, there's also a question in parapsychological terms of what may cause synchronicities. Now, of course, in the case of a religiously significant synchronicity like this one, it's easy to just say, well, God did it, and I have no reason to doubt that. But how did God do it? On the human level, the answer may involve things like precognition, telepathy, or some form of ESP. But one way or another, synchronicities do happen. Our next experience comes from a listener named Andrew. He says, About a year and a half ago, I attended a vocation exploration day at my local seminary. While at this retreat, I began to have these wonderful sensations, and I would see golden twinkling lights out of the corner of my eyes. I assumed that this was a figment of my imagination, possibly caused by the fact that I was growing closer to God than I have ever been. I assumed that these sensations and visions would stop after the retreat, but the feelings only strengthened after I left. I began to not only see the golden lights and feel the nice sensations, but also seemingly evil sensations and shadows out of the corner of my eye. The strange sensations later became more intense when the dark shadows began to apparently speak in a strange language. I had never heard anything like it. 
I told my pastor about these sensations, and he directed me to speak with an exorcist for my archdiocese. The exorcist concluded that it was not a possession, I knew this all along because I have never done anything to invite an evil spirit, and he referred me to a psychologist. The psychologist concluded that I was perfectly sane and said that whatever was happening to me was not due to a mental illness. These sensations and visions still happen to me on a daily basis. I was wondering what Jimmy's thoughts were on my strange experiences. Thanks for putting on a great show for so long. I've been listening to Mysterious World since the beginning. Congratulations on five years. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, visual disturbances can be caused by a number of different things, and that includes uh, the action of spiritual entities like God or the devil. And I agree with the exorcist that you spoke with that there's nothing you've said that indicates a possession. I'm also glad to hear that the psychologist concluded that the visual disturbances are not due to a mental illness. However, I can also think of another natural explanation for them. It's possible that they could be caused by something physical, either something in the eye or something in your neurology. And I've had some experience with that myself. For example, a number of years ago, I had a vitreous detachment in one of my eyes. That's where the vitreous gel inside of your eye detaches from the retina at the back of your eye and starts tugging on it. Uh, one of the things that can happen is tiny droplets of blood get into your eye, which can make it appear like you're looking through black snow falling from the sky. Fortunately, all of that is fixed in my case, though it involves some really interesting stories about how they fixed it that are a little unnerving and not for the super squeamish. Um, but on another occasion, uh, to give an example of another visual disturbance I had, my doctor once put me on a drug, and when she raised the dosage, I was driving home one night and started seeing a rainbow in the corner of my eye around streetlights. Uh, then I started seeing this shifting rainbow-like pattern in the corner of my eye about once a day for several days in the daytime, and I eventually was able to figure out what it was. Even though I have never had a migraine headache in my life, I was, for the first time, seeing what are known as migraine auras. And although they were not listed as a side effect of this drug, that's what was causing them. Uh, by process of elimination, I figured out that the increase in the drug dosage was the only significant recent change I'd made in my regimen. And then I went online and found other people on the drug who were also reporting migraine auras. So I went off the drug and the auras vanished. My point is that there can be biological causes for both bright and dark visual disturbances, like the bright migraine auras I had and the dark black snowfall I saw. Um, and sometimes these can indicate a condition that really needs to get treated. Like when I had my vitreous detachment, that was something that needed to be treated immediately, or it could have resulted in a full retinal detachment. So even though the disturbances that you're having don't seem to be causing you a problem right now, and while they may be purely spiritual phenomena, I would go and have them checked out by medical professionals, including and probably starting with an ophthalmologist just to be safe. Our next experience comes from Michael, an American who's living in Germany. He says, My wife and I went on pilgrimage to Rome during the Year of Mercy. I was relatively new to the Catholic faith, 2013, and didn't know what intention I should have for the pilgrimage. So I asked for the Blessed Virgin Mary to choose my intention at St. Mary Major Basilica. Like many first-timers to Rome on pilgrimage, we went to the four major basilicas. I really wanted to attend Mass somewhere in Rome, but during the four days and three nights, I couldn't find a Mass anywhere. We either couldn't locate the chapel or were too late. Our final basilica before ending the pilgrimage was St. Paul's outside the walls. I knew nothing about the location and just went because it was a basilica. Right before we left, I noticed a sign that Mass would be celebrated there. There was a main seating area, but no one showed up, so I decided on one last look around to find out if there was Mass. There was a small Mass, maybe 20 people, in the chapel directly to the left of the center. It was in Italian, so I followed the best I could. 
That chapel, the Blessed Sacrament Chapel, has a very striking crucifix, which I remember vividly. I returned home after the pilgrimage not knowing what my intentions were or if they were answered. A few days after returning, I had a vivid dream of Jesus on the cross and woke with the question of how many wounds he had suffered. I had never had this question before, so I began researching it. To my surprise, St. Bridget of Sweden had her famous apparition of Jesus in which she told her he had 5,480 wounds from his passion. St. Bridget wanted to honor each wound. Ever since that day, I have had a daily devotion to the wounds of Christ and believe that Mary pointed me towards her son. That was the pilgrimage intention. By the way, my wife prayed for another child during that trip as we had had fertility issues in the past. She was pregnant within a month of the trip and we gave birth to a healthy girl at 3 a.m. to the 2nd, which reminded us both of the traditional belief that it was the resurrection hour and as a wink from heaven to keep going. Howdy, Michael. Glad that you were able to visit Rome together. Uh, I've also visited the major basilicas there, and they're really cool. And I have a special place in my heart for St. Mary Major, and especially the Sistine Chapel there, which is different than the Sistine Chapel in St. Peter's, which is awesome in its own way. Uh, I like how you left your prayer intentions up to Mary. Uh, when I'm praying for people, I often don't know precisely what they need, you know, what would be best for them. And so I often just pray that God will help them, giving them whatever kind of help would be best, with an added prayer that God would be superlatively gentle with all of us in giving us the help that we need to get where we need to be. When it comes to your question about how many wounds Jesus had and your research that suggested uh, that St. Bridget of Sweden learned that there were 5,480 wounds, I would have a few notes of caution. Uh, first, given the amount of surface area that our bodies have, these wounds would have had to be really tiny on average. And the number sounds rather large to me for what one would expect to be inflicted by lashing, being crowned with thorns, and being nailed to a cross. Second, I don't think that we should look to private revelations as reliable sources of information on details like this. As we mentioned in previous episodes, in, in a few previous episodes, including last week, Cardinal Prospero Lambertini, uh, later Pope Benedict XIV, warned against expecting reliable numbers like this in private revelations. Back in his day, there was a controversy about whether Jesus had been crucified with three or four nails. Some visionaries saw three, some saw four. But in his still classic text on beatification and canonization, the future Benedict XIV said that the point of mystical visions was not to teach us about exact historical details like that. Instead, it is to help us grow closer to Christ. So I have no issue at all with your devotion to the wounds of Christ and your conclusion that Mary pointed you towards her son. I agree with that conclusion. I just wouldn't take the reported number of wounds as reliable, but definitely keep up your devotion. I'd also note uh, that the church has never ruled on the individual revelations that St. Bridget of Sweden reported. In 1999, uh, St. John Paul II issued a motu proprio proclaiming her as co-patroness of Europe. And in that document, he said, Yet there is no doubt that the Church, which recognized Bridget's holiness without ever pronouncing on her individual revelations, has accepted the overall authenticity of her interior experience. So the church has accepted the overall authenticity of her interior experience, but it has not pronounced one way or another on her individual revelations. Also, while n not because you brought it up, but because St. Bridget of Sweden is under discussion, I should mention something else that some people uh, may wonder about. Um, the Holy See has warned about a group of promises that are allegedly attributed to her. Uh, you sometimes see these promises printed in pamphlets. However, they are of uncertain origin. And in 1954, the Holy Office, now the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, issued a warning about those promises and insisted that bishops not give their permission to have them reprinted, though you still see them out there. When it comes to your wife's in, uh, prayer intention of getting pregnant, congratulations. Babies are awesome. 
and I'm so glad that her prayers were answered. Our next experience comes from a listener named Matt. He says, I had an experience with a shadow person some years ago. I was worried at the time, though, that it might have been something demonic, and it very well could have been. It was back when I was in high school, which was a weird time for my faith life. At the time, I practiced a kind of oral magic slash witchcraft that was centered around dragons. I became fairly adept at it as well, although looking back at what I managed to do, such as slamming the door open without moving my arm, could have other explanations, such as muscle contractions in my hand, since I had to have my hand against the door, or some kind of preternatural power, assuming that that exists. However, I still consider myself Catholic and attended Mass regularly. I didn't see a contradiction either due to poor understanding or just not wanting to admit it. But at the time, I started experiencing what I thought was demonic activity, such as seeing shadows whiz by and noticing marks show up on my skin. The final nail in the coffin, though, that is, the event that caused me to reach out to the church, was when I was in band practice after school one day. I noticed a shadow in my peripheral vision as before, but when I looked over toward it, I saw what looked like the dark, shadowy figure of a man crouching down as if watching me. I saw it for a split second, and then it disappeared. After that experience, I talked to my pastor about me experiencing possible demonic activity. I didn't think I was possessed, but maybe experiencing demonic obsession or oppression. He had me interview with the exorcist and our psychologist for the diocese. Most of what I was experiencing was chalked up to anxiety, which I believed and now completely agree with. But when I mentioned the particular instance of the shadowy figure crouching over, that caused the exorcist to stop for a moment to focus a bit on that particular instance. He asked if I was worried about that, and I responded by telling him that I was trying not to since I believe God protected my soul from demons, which was truthful. But I failed to mention that that was the final nail that caused me to seek him out. Luckily, I haven't had such an experience since. In fact, it actually pushed me back closer towards my faith and started the journey of my repentance. I've since formally denounced and have formally repented through the sacrament as well as further personal penance since I continue to struggle with some of the interior consequences of the sin of sorcery. I can now say that, through God's grace, patience, and mercy, I've been completely set free from that sin. In fact, it's been, even been transformed into a grace, since I'm much more able to relate to witches, pagans, etc., having gone through something similar myself. Howdy, Matt. It does sound like you got involved with problematic material back in high school, and it's good that you actively question uh, whether this was really paranormal or whether it could have been a natural cause, like unconscious muscle movement with your ability to affect the door that your hand was in contact with. The idiomotor effect is a real thing. Uh, we talked about it in episode 246 and again the next week in episode 247 on dowsing. And it's also good that you maintain your Catholic faith and practice during this time. When it comes to your shadow person experience, we talked about shadow people back in episode 221, and demons are one possible explanation for some shadow person encounters. But as we discussed in that episode and earlier today, just seeing things out of the corner of your eye can also have natural causes. Uh, similarly, having marks show up on your skin can also have natural causes, and I'm sure we'll talk about those in the future. However, if you're able to turn your head and look directly at a darkened human form so that it's not in your peripheral vision, then that is more significant, and getting it, getting it checked out is reasonable. I don't know what kind of magic you had been practicing, but I have always said that calling on spirits is one of the things that could lead to demonic involvement. It's not that it automatically leads to demonic involvement, but it is one of the things that at least potentially can do so. So if you were invoking spirits as part of your magic, there would be reason for concern here. I'm glad that you spoke with the diocesan exorcist and psychologist and that they found that most of what you'd been going through was due to anxiety. I'm also glad that it seems that even if the shadow person was real, and even if it was a demon in this case, the problem seems to have been solved. Repentance and the use of the sacraments are powerful protectors against the demonic because demons can't stand holy things. 
And I'm glad that God has found a way of using your prior dabbling with magic as a way to help you reach souls for Christ. So God bless you. Our next experience comes from a listener named Jason. He writes, My dad is a bricklayer, and I helped on many of his jobs. One day, we were repairing a chimney, and I had to go to the bathroom. I began to climb down the scaffolding and missed my footing. The minute I noticed, I panicked. I heard a voice in my head say, stay calm, take it one step at a time. I took a deep breath and tried to still my fears as much as I could. I managed to find my way to the rungs and slowly made my way down safely. When I jumped off to the ground, I sighed in relief. To this day, I believe that voice was my guardian angel. I've also felt my angel's presence on other occasions, even when I wasn't in danger. Thanks, Jason. Uh, When it comes to very brief, spontaneous experiences like this one, it's always hard to form a definitive conclusion because we just don't have that much data. Um, In addition to the idea that this was your guardian angel, I'd mention a few more possibilities just for the sake of completeness. Of course, it could have been a voice bubbling up from your subconscious, in which case it would have a purely natural explanation, a kind of self-talk from your subconscious to remind you of how you needed to proceed. On the other hand, in addition to being an angel, it could have been God, or it could have been someone else, like a departed loved one who's looking out for you. However, I have no basis on which to challenge the interpretation that it was your guardian angel. That interpretation is fine with me. I'm glad that it happened, and I'm glad that you've sensed your guardian angel's presence in other situations. Our next experience comes from a listener named Carmen, who was 11 years old when she sent it in, though she may be 12 now. Carmen says, I heard that you were taking in mysteries from both faith and reason, and I felt impelled to share this story with you and anyone else listening. A couple of years ago, me and the rest of my family were at a hiking trail place where you could rent a cabin. We were around the fire pit outside, roasting hot dogs and marshmallows. It was a very cloudy night. I remember that someone said, the only thing that could make this better would be if the stars were out. Then, I believe someone brought up a sort of faith-themed conversation. As we continued to talk about God, the clouds began to part. Someone eventually pointed this out. We all watched as the clouds moved further and further away from each other. I swear we saw the entire Milky Way galaxy in front of our eyes. The clouds eventually closed again, but not until we had fully taken in the experience and seen some shooting stars. This event could easily be explained through reason. However, I believe it was simply God giving us a sort of glimpse into heaven. P.S. A while ago, you did an episode on sleep, saying that in the future you would do one on dreams. Will that come out anytime soon? It really interested me. Howdy, Carmen. You've, you're certainly correct that this experience could have been purely natural in origin, but you're also right that it could have been God just doing a favor for you. And these two possibilities are not in opposition with each other because nature functions the way God wants it to. And so coincidences that have purely natural causes can also be understood as part of God's providence, even if they don't deviate from the normal operation of nature in a way that would allow us to confidently identify them as miracles. To mention a third possibility, though I don't consider this one particularly likely, There are reports of people being able to disperse clouds through mental concentration. This would be a form of psychokinesis, or mind over matter, and it's sometimes referred to as cloud busting. As we heard in episodes like episode 195 on poltergeists and episode 260 on the 21st century poltergeist and episode 295 on the popper poltergeist, It's even possible for psychokinesis to operate subconsciously without anyone trying to make it happen. So there could be subconscious psychokinetic cloud busting happening in this case. However, um, subconscious psychokinesis tends to happen when someone's under a lot of stress. And that seems to be the opposite of the relaxed campfire scene that you describe. I'm not seriously proposing that this third explanation is what happened in your family's case. I I just mentioned it for fun. Uh, But we will have a link to an article on cloud busting so you can read about it. 
When it comes to episodes on dreams, I'm still doing research on that subject, and I'm not sure when we'll have one coming out, but they're definitely coming. Our next experience comes from a listener named Bethany. She says, Before this particular event, I was always leery of tales involving the supernatural. I don't know if I'd go as far as to say I was a skeptic, but maybe. On August 25th, 2006, that changed. It was the day of my wedding, and I was busy getting ready. I was so happy as I walked down the stairs in my dress and makeup. But there was a bit of sadness, too. Three of my grandparents had already passed away, and the final surviving grandmother was not well enough to travel into town for the big day. I missed them all very much. As I descended the stairs, my uncle passed by on the first floor and saw my sad expression. He asked what was wrong, and I simply said, I wish Grandma and Grandpa were here. At that moment, a nearby picture frame fell over. It was a photo of my grandma. It is a sturdy frame, and no one was near enough to bump it in any way. It has never fallen before or since. After the clatter, my uncle and I locked eyes with total astonishment. I felt tears coming, which I quickly suppressed so as not to smear my mascara, but I knew for sure that I didn't need to wish my grandparents were there with me. They were there. Anyways, that's my story. I'm still always looking for natural explanations for our mysterious world, but I'm a lot more open to the idea that, sometimes, there are supernatural forces at work. Howdy, Bethany. The kind of experience that you report is actually common in the parapsychological literature. It's a familiar type of spontaneous field experience, and it's a form of what's known as after-death communication, or ADC. Uh, Many people have reported objects moving like this in significant circumstances. Sometimes an object connected with a loved one will fall or fall over at the moment of the person's death. Other times, even after the person has died, it will move in a way that the living interpret as a sign of communication, which is how you took it. Also, from a theological perspective, I'd be confident that your deceased grandmother was with you in spirit on your wedding day, even if the picture had not fallen. Your desire to have your deceased grandparents there would have established a connection with them, like when we ask our departed loved ones for their intercession. Theologians have discussed precisely how our departed loved ones might learn of our prayer requests, and according to one theory, God himself lets them know, hey, this person wants your prayers. On the other hand, it could just be telepathy. But whatever is responsible, I'm sure that your grandparents knew that you wished they could be with you, and so they were with you spiritually on your wedding day. What's more, you were fortunate to enough to get a tangible indication that this was the case. So congratulations. Our next experience comes from a listener in Wales named Richard. He says, When I was young in the mid-80s, my mom owned a chippy, fish and chip shop, in our hometown of Hollywell, North Wales. As an aside, the town is named after the shrine of St. Winifred, which has its own mysteries, a resurrected saint and many miraculous healings, although it's pronounced Hollywell. The business was in a three-story 18th century building, which I think was originally part of the neighboring pub called the Feathers Inn. After school, my brother, cousin, and I would play in the abandoned upper floors, although I didn't dare go into the attic. My mom tells the story about how my brother and cousin had been up there one day and had come down arguing about which of them was the boy's best friend. When asked who they were talking about, they explained that they'd been playing with a boy in the attic. Confused, my mom went up and checked. There was no one there, and there was no other way in or out. They would have been six or seven at the time, and neither of them remember it now. My mom thinks they were playing with a ghost. About eight years later, my dad, brother again, and I were in our garden. We'd been planting potatoes when we saw a large fireball, for want of a better description, moving across the sky. It appeared to be slightly bigger than the sun, although not knowing how far away it was, I can't be sure of its actual size. We were looking south, and it was moving east to west at an elevation of 30 degrees until it went behind a hill. It lasted less than a minute. Every now and then I asked them if they remember it to check that it wasn't a figment of my imagination. I have no idea what it was. Howdy, Richard. These are two very interesting experiences. The first one that you report, assuming the boys were being truthful, is quite consistent with a ghost. Of course, it could also be that your mom simply missed the boy when she looked upstairs, but assuming she didn't, 
It's consistent with spontaneous field reports of apparitions. I would note, though, that apparitions don't always have to be of ghosts, the spirits of deceased people. As we heard in episode 210 on the Haunted House of Marin County, living people can also generate apparitions. In fact, the British Society for Psychical Research back in the uh, 1800s published a two-volume work called Phantasms of the Living, which I believe discusses this. When it comes to your second experience, you're right that it's hard to estimate the size of objects in the sky, including the sun, but it does sound like what you saw was of impressive size. There are such things as fireballs, and they're basically large meteors, and if they're big enough, they can even be seen during the daytime. The fact that what you saw moved from east to west is also consistent with the rotation of the earth, though meteors don't have to move from east to west. You say that it lasted less than a minute, which suggests that it was in the sky for quite a few seconds, but that doesn't fit with meteors or conventional fireballs because they are very quick, lasting only a few seconds at most. Of course, it's possible that you saw something exotic like an alien spaceship or a piece of advanced human technology being tested, But I can think of one more conventional phenomenon that you might have witnessed. Based on your description, it seems to have been visible for quite a number of seconds, and it sounds like it was moving parallel to the ground since you give it a definite elevation of 30 degrees up in the sky. That fits with the re-entry of something that we launched into orbit, like a satellite or a rocket booster. According to aerospace.org, The general rule of thumb is that natural meteor re-entries happen quickly and typically last less than a few seconds, while human-made re-entries happen slowly and typically can last 20 to 90 seconds or more. If an object moves slowly and steadily across the sky at a speed similar to how a fast aircraft would move, and it is trailing a long glowing streak behind it, it is probably a re-entry. If there appear to be a tight cluster of bright points all moving in the same direction at similar speeds and all leaving streaks behind them, then it is very probably a re-entry breakup. Now, re-entry objects don't have to break up, but sometimes they do. Uh, Based on what you've said, my current best guess would be that you may have seen the re-entry of something we launched. There are even websites to track re-entries. So if you knew more about the time that this happened, you might be able to figure out what it was. And we'll have a link to the page we just quoted from so that you can read more about re-entries and how to distinguish them from meteors and watch watch, uh, videos. Our next experience comes from a listener named Nicholas. He says, I really love your Mysterious World podcasts. I know you have asked for mysterious stories. I would like to share mine. Background facts and information. This is vital to the story. One, I am a solicitor, which you call an attorney in the U.S., in the U.K. Two, my former wife is Lynn. We divorced in 2007. We have three children, all girls. Three, my wife's mother was called Mayor White. English was not her first language, but it was okay. Her first language was Welsh. I got on well with her. I called her Nanny Bach. Bach is Welsh for little. She died in 2003. Four. My mother is 94 and totally still with it. 5. The doctor was one of my best friends, but we fell out badly over Brexit. I was pro-Brexit, he was not. 6. The priest is still active in the local church. I no longer go there for Mass, but to the oratory where the Tridentine Mass is celebrated. I am a trad Catholic. 7. The events took place in 2007 over a three- to four-month period. The events. One. Two of my girls were with me on a Saturday afternoon. Their mother came to collect them. As they were leaving, I asked them if they had moved the small black serrated edged kitchen knife used for cutting veg, etc. I had last seen it on a surface near the kettle in the kitchen. They had not moved it. I searched everywhere. No knife. Two days later, my eyes popped out of my head when I saw the knife on a kitchen surface. No one had been in the house except me since the girls left. Two. A few days later, the same thing happened with a knife. My recollection of this second event is vague, and I now question if it happened. 3. A couple of weeks later, my mother came to stay. 
She has grapefruit for breakfast. She could not find the black knife and asked me to look for it. I could not find it. I went to the dishwasher and lifted out the cutlery basket. I put it on a kitchen surface. My mother was next to me. We both looked in the basket. There was no knife, but then there it was in the basket. We were both astonished. Four. I was so shocked I called my friend, the doctor, and told him what had happened. I then asked him to speak to my mother, who confirmed what had happened. Five. My mother accepts this happened, but says there must be a natural explanation. Six. A couple of weeks later, I woke in the night. I had probably been holding the miraculous medal in my hand when I fell asleep. I got up to use the bathroom. I walked ten paces to the loo and sat down. I heard something fall behind my back. I looked and saw it was the medal, the Medal of Mary. 7. Over the course of the next few weeks, on several occasions when I got up in the morning, I noticed the hall curtains had been moved about four inches. I am sure it was not me in my sleep. I am a light sleeper and have never done anything unusual in my sleep. 8. A couple of weeks later, on Sunday, two of my girls were with me. I left the house to go round the corner to make a purchase in the local shop. I returned and pushed open the porch door. What I saw set my heart beating. The porch door has a lock that is activated by turning a key. The door is never locked because the doors do not shut as the wood has swelled. I had no idea where the key to the door was, but the bolt had been moved to the lock position. That is, someone must have found the key, turned it, but not engaged it with the other door. There was no key in the door, and I had to search high and low to find it. 9. I called my doctor friend, and he said I should call the priest. I did, and he attended. 10. Before I put down what he said, note this. The events spell out the name Nanny Bach. Knife missing three times. Miraculous Medal of Mary. Mary. Mare in Welsh. Metal fall at my back and the door lock opens. The k sound of lock equating to the second bach. Curtain in Welsh is len, pretty close to lin in sound. I told all that to the priest, not about the curtain. I had not looked up the Welsh word to my, in my dictionary at that time. 12. The priest listened and asked if anything unusual had happened in my life at the time. Yes, my eldest daughter had stopped seeing me due to her divided loyalties. She did not see me for two years. The priest equated what was happening with this and that Nanny Bach was the agent. Note, Nanny Bach was totally overdevoted to her children, calling them at least once a day. She would not let go of them even in the afterlife, I believe. 13. The priest blessed the house with holy water and offered mass for Nanny Bach. No further activity occurred. 14. Nanny Bach was not religious, but knew I was. Was she calling out to me? Did she know I would eventually get a priest involved? And that was what she wanted to be somehow freed? That's it, Jimmy. It all sounds bonkers, I know. Has it helped me? Yes. If I have doubt about the afterlife, I can bring myself back to faith by recalling these weird events. I cannot explain them other than by accepting there is activity after death. Thanks, Nicholas. Uh, this complex of experiences involves a few different things. First, regarding the mysterious disappearance and reappearance of objects like the knife in different places, uh, that's referred to in parapsychology as apportation. There are natural explanations for some apparent apports, like when you merely forget where something was placed, or non-cognitive seeing, where you just don't notice something that really is there in front of you. Although, that's not as good of an explanation when two people are looking at the same spot, like the cutlery basket, and neither of them sees the object. However, there are other cases where apportations seem to be paranormal in nature. There's been some recent work done on the subject by a British researcher named Mary Rose Barrington, who refers to apports as jot, or just one of those things. We'll have a link to her book and another book by a researcher named Tony Jinks. The turning of the door lock, uh, if it had a paranormal explanation, would be psychokinesis or mind over matter. When it comes to the overall complex of events, I find your interpretation of them as an attempt at communication by Nanny Bach very interesting. I'd be a little cautious about the rebus-like spelling out of her name, which involves some rather subjective elements, 
But the fact that you called a priest and the phenomena subsided after he blessed the house and said Mass for her is consistent with the hypothesis that she reached out to you from the afterlife to get help. Uh, The spirits of the departed asking for the help of the living, such as prayers and having Mass said, is very well established in the history of ghosts and apparitions. And you, as a family member she knew to be religious and thus who might be able to get her the help she needed— it's certainly possible that Nanny Bach figured out a way to reach you and get that help, which is great. So before we continue with more of your listener mysterious experiences, we'd like to stop here and take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Scott M., Kathleen G., Countess O., Minerva C., and Kate W. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give Make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering top brand contact lenses at always low prices. With free delivery, visit DeliverContacts.com and by... Tim Shevlin's personal fitness training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. Our next experience comes from a listener named Anna Lara. She says, I grew up in a traditional Catholic family. My parents had two children, myself and my younger brother. My dad worked outside the home, and my mom was a stay-at-home parent. When my brother and I were kids, we were enrolled in several extracurricular activities in the afternoon. Because we lived in a large city, my mom spent her afternoons chauffeuring us around. Finally, when I was about 10 or 11 years old, my mom decided that I was old enough to stay at home by myself for an hour or two in the afternoons to work on my homework while she took my brother to football practice. We lived in a duplex. My house and my neighbors had a house plan that mirrored each other. My bedroom shared a wall with my neighbors and was above our kitchen. Very often when I was left home by myself while I was doing my homework in my bedroom, I could hear the sound of dishes being hand washed. Imagine all the noisy sounds that accompanied that task. Water running, loud clinking of glasses, plates and utensils as they were being washed and put to dry. The sound was so clear to me that I often walked downstairs because I figured that my mom was home cleaning up the kitchen, and somehow I'd missed her letting me know she was home. The kitchen was always empty and quiet. After several instances of such occurrence, I explained it to myself as my neighbor doing her dishes, as her kitchen was close-ish to my bedroom. Mind you, at no other time could I hear any noise coming from her house, but because my house was so quiet at that hour, it was reasonable to think that's why I could hear the noise. I mentioned it to my mom, but she thought nothing of it. A couple of years later, I was spending my vacation at my grandma's house, a good 550 miles from my hometown. Her house was a large, single-family home, centered on a big lot with no shared walls of any neighbors. For some reason, I was home alone one evening, and as I was walking downstairs, I hear this familiar sound of dishes being washed. It was weird because the house was dark and no light was coming from the kitchen. The minute I got close to the kitchen, the sound stopped. As I walked back... To go upstairs, I heard the sound again. A few more years passed by. One day, my mom and I were chatting with one of my aunts, my mom's sister, and my aunt mentions that she often hears dishes being washed at my grandma's when she's there alone. My mom looks at me puzzled, points at me, and says, Well, she hears them at our home. And of course, I had to add, I've heard them at my grandma's too. Later, we found out that my cousin, who lives in a completely different city than myself or my grandma, has heard the dishwashing happen at her house, too. In the kitchens, when you go investigate, all three of them are always empty and quiet. Now, my family has a big devotion to the souls in purgatory and prays for them often. My great-grandmother taught the family to pray for them and ask them to guard their homes from accidents, robberies, and calamities, which some people in my family still do to this day. It is our belief that it's the souls from purgatory doing what it was asked of them, and somehow making their presence known. Thanks, Jimmy and Dom, for the opportunity to share with you my family's mystery. Do you have any insight on what could it be? Could it be the souls in purgatory? 
is there a natural explanation that we are missing? Let me say that if it happens to be the souls in purgatory and I end up going there when I die, I hope there's no dishwashing expected from me. Howdy, Anna Laura. Um, I certainly can't rule out that it's souls in purgatory. It's also possible that it's just an attempt at communication from a deceased relative. But speaking in terms of how I would analyze this in a, as a parapsychological field investigator, I would, of course, naturally look for natural explanations first, like whether the noises could have been coming from the neighbor's home or whether they could have been caused by something else in the home. However, assuming that the noises have a paranormal explanation, the thing they, mo they most sound like is a haunting. This is a technical term in parapsychology, and it doesn't mean that a ghost or a spirit is behind the noises. Instead, hauntings are understood as recordings of events that were laid down in the past, so they're a kind of place memory. Uh, so experience a haunting, experiencing a haunting is kind of like watching a movie. It's uh, something that occurred a long time ago by people who were still alive at the time, like watching Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers performing in the movie Top Hat. Uh, when the movie was made back in 1935, Astaire and Rogers were both alive, even, and even though they're both dead now, you can still see and hear a recording of them dancing back in 1935. And essentially, that's what hauntings are thought to be recordings laid down by living people, whether they're still alive or not. What distinguishes a haunting from an apparition is that hauntings aren't really interactive. You can see or hear them, but you see and hear basically the same thing every time. There's no actual communication. You can't really hold a conversation with a haunting the way you can an apparition. And one of the most common forms of hauntings is kitchen sounds, like washing dishes, because every home has a kitchen area, and every kitchen gets used a lot, and the same type of activity, like washing dishes, uh, happens there over and over. So there's a likelihood of recordings getting laid down in the kitchen. While I can't, based on what I presently know, rule out either natural causes or the involvement of human spirits, what these experiences at least sound like to me are hauntings or place memories of dishes being washed. And maybe you, your aunt, and your cousin are sensitive to picking up on these hauntings when the house is still and quiet. Our next experience comes from a listener named Barrett. He says, Almost 20 years ago, I had an unusual but uplifting encounter with my grandfather. It was one that I will never forget and would eventually become a great comfort to my mother. At the time, I was in a master's degree program working at a job and raising two young children with my wife. Like many other mornings, I woke up before everyone else and sleepily walked out into the living room just as the sun was rising. But this was not like every other morning. As I was putting the last book in my bag, I noticed the sound of an ambulance approaching in the distance. It was so quiet as to be barely audible. Keep in mind that we lived in a rural part of Oregon and there was very little traffic on our road, especially at that time of day. Suddenly, my mind came awake and I somehow knew my 96-year-old grandfather, who lived a couple of miles down the road, was present in my house even though he could not be seen. I could feel his emotions and he was experiencing extreme happiness and relishing the freedom of being released from his body. In that instant, I knew he had died and was no longer suffering from heart failure. He had left his body and was thrilled to be free from pain, and there was definitely a sense that he was not walking, but moving through the air at a high rate of speed. It was so intense that I looked up to my ceiling and then out my living room window, but did not see him. He never spoke to me, and in just a couple of minutes, the experience ended, and everything seemed to go back to normal. I was left with a distinct impression he had left this world and had moved on to heaven. As I was standing there trying to process what had just happened, my phone rang. It was my father calling and he said, I have to tell you something. Before he could say anything else, I blurted out, Grandpa died, I know already. There was a long pause and then he asked me how I could know, so I told him what had happened just minutes before. We agreed that I'd stop by their place later that evening and tell my mother about my experience in person. At this point, I was late for class, 
so I told my dad goodbye and hung up the phone. Nothing like this has ever happened to me again, and I still think about it from time to time. I'm curious why this didn't happen to with my mother or father, who have both passed away. I was very close to both of them and would have been greatly comforted by participating in their passing. These things are hard to understand, and I won't get all of the answers I'm looking for until I am reunited with my family in heaven. Howdy, Barrett. Uh, what you're describing is what's known as a visitation. Uh, this is a situation in which a person who is deceased appears to visit a living person, and they often happen at the time of or just after the person has died. Often, they alert the recipient to the fact that the person has just died, and they may convey other things, like the sense uh, that the person is okay in the afterlife, as, as, as in your case. Uh, visitations are a form of what's known as after-death communication, or ADC, and statistically, about a third of after-death communications come in the form of a strong feeling or intuition, again, as in your case. Also in your case, uh, you have verification in the form of your father calling you just after the event to let you know that your grandfather had died. Uh, this makes it a veridical experience that has independent objective confirmation. Of course, a skeptic who refuses to believe in such experience could look at the event and say, well, your, your grandfather was 96, he was, so he's going to be passing on soon in any case, and you knew that, so it was rumbling around in your subconscious, and when you heard the ambulance in the distance, you subconsciously deduced that your grandfather had just died and there was nothing psychic here. But I'm not a skeptic who doesn't believe in such experiences. I'm open to them happening, and I'm sure that your impression of how powerful the experience was, so that you even looked up, up at the ceiling and out the window, you know, serves as further confirmation that this wasn't just something coming to your mind randomly, but was in fact an accurate perception of your grandfather in his new state of peace and liberation. When it comes to your not having similar experiences with your mother and father when they passed, I really wouldn't read anything into that. Uh, such experiences are quite uncommon. So statistically speaking, we wouldn't expect them to have to, we wouldn't expect to have them with everybody we love, especially not in experiences as powerful as the one you report with your grandfather. But you can still know that your parents are in God's loving hands and that you'll see them again one day. Our next experience comes from a listener named Mike. He writes, I don't know why, but this story is very difficult for me to convey to others. I'll do my best. About 10 years ago, shortly after going to bed, I don't know if I was actually asleep, a strange event began to happen. I had the feeling that I was escaping my body and lifting out of my room. I remember looking down on the end table and lamp next to my bed, then I kept moving upward. In short order, I was surrounded in darkness until finally I entered an area with light emanating from the distance. As I approached the light, an overwhelming feeling of belonging, welcoming, love, and peace overcame me. I cannot describe what it was like, just pure contentment and joy. Shadowy figures surrounding the light recognized me, and I felt they were very pleased to see me. I didn't know exactly who they were, but I felt they were my long-deceased great-aunts who were always very happy to see me. The only comparison is a highly intensified version of coming home from college when everyone greets you lovingly. Anyway, it was like they expected me, but were still surprised I was there. I felt like I could have stayed forever, but soon I felt myself going back. Before I knew it, I saw my room again, and I could physically feel re-entering my body, from my head down to my legs. I remember it was the first time I actually felt gravity. I have three children, and I thought immediately how trivial their problems were, making the baseball team, etc., and I only hoped they would someday enter the space I just had. My wife was awake, reading a book next to me the whole time. I was shocked and said I would tell her what happened in the morning. That was it. Full disclosure, I do remember watching an episode of Ancient Aliens before going to bed and consciously wondering if God was real. It was the first time I ever doubted this fact, and the last. Howdy, Mike. Uh, the experience that you describe is what's known as an out-of-body experience, or OBE. Uh, they are commonly reported, and we'll be talking about them in future episodes. 
much of the time when people have out-of-body experiences, they seem to travel to another physical location somewhere here on Earth. But there are experiences reported where people seem to go to other realms. Uh, This is where OBEs can sometimes blend in with near-death experiences or NDEs. Uh, It sounds like in your experience, you were able to make contact with your deceased great aunts and feel some of the joy that they and others feel in the afterlife. Uh, From what you say, you weren't physically near death, so this wasn't an NDE in the conventional sense, but it sounds like an OBE where you were able to have some kind of contact with the realm of the deceased. And it's possible that this spontaneous experience was one God allowed you to have to address your momentary doubts. So that's something to be thankful for. Our next experience comes from a listener named Lisa. She writes, I am no longer young, and I have had a life inundated with mystical and mysterious events. But there is one that may be of special interest to Jimmy and his audience that has to do with the phenomena of deja vu, which is the experience of a current event as if it were a memory or remembered dream, or as if it had happened once before. As a child and young woman, I had powerful deja vu experiences that would start with a premonition, then expand into a play-by-play of an event that was happening as if my knowledge of the event was time-shifted ahead by a second or two. For example, I would get the feeling, and then the phone would ring. I could see that my sister would answer it first. She did. As she was saying hello, I could see in my mind what she would do next, call my mother. If I relaxed, the interval would grow a little larger, so I'd be two or three steps ahead in predicting, anticipating the events in front of me. I found it very satisfying. This was a common and frequent experience for me from the time I could remember things around age three. On the rare occasions when I tried to explain this to others, I was rebuked as being attention-seeking or too imaginative or even called a witch. When I was about nine years old, we moved into a Pentecostal community that was devoted to the Calvinist concept of predestination, which I found personally repellent. Although I did not have a strong personal faith tradition and did not comprehend it theologically, I rejected the concept of predestination. Therefore, I decided for myself that this deja vu experience was suspicious and too close to predestination. I decided to reject it. I was probably 11 years old, maybe 12. I was sitting at the dinner table with my family and two friends from school when I had the feeling and the strong pre-awareness of the next few moments which involved passing a basket of corn muffins around the table. It was like living my life with a two-second echo. First, my internal experience of what would happen, and then it would be copied by the real world in real time. I decided at the moment that the basket started moving that I would reject the preordination of the deja vu foreknowledge of what was about to happen. The muffin basket passed from my father to my mother, then to my sister, and each of them chose the preordained muffin and made the preordained comments. I felt this increasing internal panic as the scene played out exactly as I had foreseen. The basket passed to me. I knew exactly which muffin I was supposed to take. I could hear my voice making some silly remark that I was supposed to say. My hand irresistibly reached for the foretold muffin. It was as if the entire world and time itself stopped as I took the basket. There was a roaring in my ears. I could hardly breathe. Summoning all my will, I screamed no in my head and forced myself to take a different muffin. I said nothing and passed the basket. I honestly thought I might die. In my head and in my heart, there was a rending, tearing sound or a feeling or sound like the way gears and a manual transmission grind when you miss the shift. I got up and ran to the bathroom. I was crying and shaking. I washed my face, came back to the table, and tried to pretend to be normal. It was several weeks before I realized the deja vu experiences had ended. I've rarely had them since that day, and I confess that at first I was sorry that it had stopped. After this event, I was prone to bouts of fainting, brought on by very mundane events like unpacking groceries or hearing the phone ring. I was afraid that the deja vu had turned into fainting, but I may have just been malnourished and anemic. These were hard times. I'm sorry to hear about the hard times, Lisa, and I'm sorry uh, to hear about you having such a disturbing experience like this one. 
Uh, what I can say is that deja vu likely has a number of different causes, some of which are purely natural. However, based on your description, it sounds like you were having precognitively based deja vu. That is, you were having precognitive experiences that showed you what was about to happen, and then it did. You even had some control over the experiences as you learned to relax and expand the precognition interval. Having, precog having precognitive experiences is not, is not unusual. They are frequently reported, and they frequently concern totally mundane things, like when the telephone is about to ring and who's calling, something we'll definitely talk about in the future, although in some cases that appears to be telepathy rather than precognition. When it comes to the fact that you were able to take a different muffin than the one you had seen in your precognitive experience, that's what's known as an intervention paradox. You intervened in the situation in a way that was different than what you saw precognitively. The same kind of intervention paradox happens when people see things like a train that they're scheduled to take is going to crash, so they switch to a different train. And, and then it turns out the one they originally were scheduled to be on does crash. So they intervened in a way that changed what was otherwise going to happen to them. I think that what intervention paradoxes reveal is fairly straightforward. What precognition shows us is not a fixed, unalterable image of the future. Instead, if precognition is real and there is evidence supporting this, what it shows us is the probable future. In other words, it shows us what's likely to happen if nothing changes. But that doesn't stop us from acting in other ways so that we can avoid any foreseen dangers. And that fits with what you'd expect from evolution. Uh, knowing the future can be a big benefit. That's why we humans have developed under God's providence to be so good at calculating what's likely to happen. We are prediction masters compared to other creatures, simply because our brain power lets us figure things out well in advance. Well, if you have a good idea what's likely to happen, that will help you survive and reproduce better because you can avoid dangers, for example. And so evolution has favored our calculation ability to, and enabled us to make good predictions. The same considerations would favor the development of precognition. It also would enhance an organism's ability to survive and reproduce. But it wouldn't do that so well if it showed us a fixed, unalterable future. You know, if you see precognitively that tomorrow you're going to get eaten by a cave bear and there's nothing you can do to avoid that, well, that doesn't really help you survive. Um, what will help you survive is seeing what's likely to happen if nothing changes. Like tomorrow, there will be a cave bear sniffing around the door of your cave, but you can still arrange not to be there when the cave bear is so you can avoid getting eaten. As part of God's plan, evolution thus would favor the development of probable future precognition over actual future precognition. So I'm not at all surprised that you were able to take a different corn muffin than the one you initially foresaw. Unfortunately, you were very concerned about a Calvinistic idea of predestination at the time, and it was uh, creating considerable anxiety for the young you. Um, that then turned what could have been a much milder experience, you know, hey, I'll just do something different and pick a different corn muffin. It took, turned that into a traumatic experience that resulted in you screaming in your mind and then running to the bathroom crying and shaking. And you have all my sympathy regarding that experience. Given what you were dealing with, it's totally understandable. When it comes to the disappearance or at least diminishment of your precognitive experiences, my guess is that you found the corn muffin incident so traumatic that you subconsciously refused to let yourself have many more precognition experiences like this. You understandably didn't want to go through another experience like that one, and so you haven't had them as frequently since. So I think that the disappearance of the deja vu was likely not because your precognitive abilities have vanished, but because you developed a subconscious block 
to using precognition as much. Now that you're older and more mature and have more perspective, you might consider being open to precognitive experiences like those you had in your youth and see if they start happening more often. If you'd like information about how you might do that, uh, feel free to contact me at feedback at mysterious.fm, and God bless you. Our next experience comes from our feedback coordinator, Rob Leonardi, and he reports experiences that also involve precognition and changing the future. He writes, My family, particularly on my dad's side, has always had some sort of precognitive or maybe preternatural abilities. When I was a kid, my dad woke up panicked the morning I was scheduled to go to a water park at summer day camp. He was able to draw out the water park map from his dream and told me that his dream was of me drowned in the wave pool so that I needed to be careful. Of course, being the good son I was, I spent a lot of time in the wave pool. In fact, I decided I wanted to find out how far I could get on a tube before the waves started. I was only one of a few people into the deep area of the wave pool when suddenly someone ripped the tube out from under me and the alarm bell rang that the waves were starting. Thinking of my dad's warning, I bolted out of there as fast as I could without any harm. Some of that ability, I felt, got passed on to me, albeit I found it more prevalent when I was younger and before I really got into my faith. When I was a teen, my sister left the house late at night and called me 15 minutes later, saying she just turned around because she forgot something and asked me to get it for her to pick up. I said sure and got it, but then I got this strange feeling that she turned around for a reason greater than what she forgot. When she came back, I gave her what she forgot, and I told her to be careful because something was wrong and she needed to be on the lookout or something because she came back for a reason other than that. Fifteen minutes later, she called me saying that the road she had taken was now blocked off because, as she asked the police officers, 30 minutes ago a fatal accident occurred. Right about the exact time she would have been there. These experiences also involve precognition intervention paradoxes, and they go right along with what we were just discussing regarding Lisa's experiences. As you would expect from God giving us precognition, whether through evolution or in some other way, we would expect it to be probable future precognition rather than unalterable future precognition. Uh, sending the probable future will give us information we can act on. Sensing an unalterable future wouldn't help us as much. So Rob and his father's experiences with precognition are more evidence that we have the more helpful kind of precognition, and thus that we don't need to be afraid that we're fated to experience whatever we precognitively see. The evidence is that we can take action to avoid bad things, Evolutionarily speaking, that would be why we have precognition in the first place. And good job to you, Rob, for navigating these experiences this way. Our next experience comes from a listener who uses the handle Anonymous in the Southwest. My little Eucharistic miracle. At the 9 a.m. Mass on September 1st, 2019, I experienced what I believe was the body and blood of my Lord Jesus Christ while serving as an extraordinary minister of the blood of Christ at St. Francis Xavier Parish in Phoenix, Arizona. Standing in a row of about six of us, I was preparing to receive my portion of the body of Christ from the priest. I took it in my hand and placed it on my tongue. In that instant, I could feel about 75% of it on my right side become gelatinous. The remaining portion on my left side stayed crisp. I immediately began to think maybe I had something else in my mouth from something I ate but I always brush my teeth and I don't eat before morning masses, so that was not possible. Before I bit into it, I could feel bubbles forming from the gelatin which remained intact, and as I bit into the host, a liquid substance started to flow with the consistency of honey from the bubbles. I could taste it was metallic, a little salty, yet a little sweet. It continued to flow from the host as I held it in my mouth, a sensation I had never experienced before. Obviously, liquids come to the mouth from the front of the mouth, not from within. It did not burst, it did not melt too quickly, but the flow was constant such that I was able to identify that I was tasting blood. It continued to fill my mouth as I drank it, as if two or three ounces had come from the small host. It was not my blood. I was not in pain at all. I did not have any sore or bleeding gums that could have been the source of blood. 
Even if I did have that, the host was the origin of the blood, not my gums, my cheek, or anything else. I must have had an alarmed look on my face as I took a longer pause than normal because the woman next to me mouthed the words, Are you all right? I just looked at her and said nothing. I wanted to open my mouth and touch my finger to my tongue, but I dared not do so. I simply reluctantly swallowed it, and I felt it disappear down my throat. I was disappointed it was gone. I was administering the chalice, and the priest had handed everyone else their chalices except for me. The same woman who spoke to me earlier shrugged her shoulders when no other chalices were left on the altar. Father then handed me his chalice, and as I went to drink from it, I saw there was a host floating in it. I drank from the cup, and in my mind, compared this taste to what I just had, and it was not the same. We all departed the altar to go to our stations. I did not continue thinking about the experience until I finished administering the cup and returned to the sanctuary. I looked into the chalice and saw I still had much wine left to drink. I drank it along with the floating host. Again, I compared textures and taste. The taste and the wine were not even close to tasting like blood. To this day, I continue to savor the host when it rests in my mouth, but the consistency is not the same as when the host was saturated with wine or when it transformed. I went back to my seat and prayed the English translation of Tantum Ergo after communion. Then I got to the part that says, Faith tells us Christ is present when our human senses fail. And I paused. I simply couldn't say that. My human senses told me that I actually consumed the sacred body and blood, the actual true physical body and blood of my Lord. I could not grasp the magnitude of that moment. It would take a few days to process what had happened. I eventually remembered that the previous Thursday night, I had an episode of doubt. I had arrived home from work in a terrible mood, for what felt like no reason, and I immediately called a friend of mine. I told her that everything I thought that I experienced that brought me to Catholicism, to divorce my husband, to leave my old life, was a fraud. I had fooled myself into thinking that all the signs I thought were from God, all the answered prayers, everything, was all in my head and the result of my overactive imagination. I thought all of God's activity in my life was a lie. I had forgotten that I had this episode, and when I remembered, I called my friend again to find out what I said to her. She told me I was inconsolable and angry. Our phone call was two and a half hours long. I barely remember any of it. Then a few days after I remembered the doubt, I looked up Eucharistic miracles. I found a list of miracles that occurred with the Eucharist, but none were like mine. And I read that they occur after periods of doubt. I would not recommend anyone test this by feigning doubt. But I do have to wonder how many other faithful around the world every day have a similar experience but say nothing about it. I believe it happens more frequently than we could know. I told my brother about it and some close faithful friends. I also told my father, who accused me of biting my lip, which is ridiculous because, at the time it happened, I did not have any pain in my mouth. He did end up converting two months later, another miracle. My prayer is that everyone believe in the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. After all, anything is possible for God. Thank you, Anonymous. Uh, we discussed certain Eucharistic miracles back in episode 200, but these were miracles where the Eucharist did not transform inside people's mouths. Instead, they were instances, at least not, at least not most of them, uh, instead they were instances where the Eucharist seemed to transform in other circumstances. If I were to have the Eucharist transform in my mouth, I would do the same thing that you did. I would take note of it, try to think about it and what could have caused the sensations, and then I'd swallow it. Uh, I would take that to be my indicated course of action from the fact that it, the transformation happened in my mouth. I appreciate uh, that Anonymous is very analytical in thinking about this. She considers alternative natural explanations and whether they could be responsible and concludes that they couldn't have been. She links the occurrence of this apparent miracle to an episode of doubt that she had recently experienced, and I find this plausible, since one, not the only, but one of the functions of miracles is to strengthen the faith of those who are aware of them. In her case, this would be a personal miracle meant primarily to strengthen her own faith. When it comes to how common such uh, miracles are, I also agree with her. I think that such Eucharistic miracles are much more common than we know. 
Uh, there are some Eucharistic miracles that are meant to be public that occur outside of the mouths of the recipients, and some of these come to public attention. But I think there are many more that occur privately, particularly when they occur in the privacy of an individual communicant's mouth. Recently, my pastor here in Arkansas asked me about this. Uh, he reported to me that a local woman uh, had said that she had a similar experience, and he wanted to know if I'd heard of anything similar. Well, based on my knowledge of Anonymous's experience, I was happy to report that I had, and I'm sure that such experiences are much more common than comes to public attention. So thank you for sharing your experience, Anonymous. Our next experience comes from a listener named Steve. He says, When I was nine, I became very sick and had to go to the doctor. My parents were very poor and had to drag my grandparents along on their doctor's visit to cover the cost. Even at that young age, I was very upset that I had to get sick, which caused such an embarrassing moment for my parents. While waiting in the doctor's office, I was playing with some of the toys, and an old man approached and asked me what I was doing there. I told him some of the situation, and he asked me if I wanted to be healed, and I said yes. I was instantly healed and went to tell my parents. They asked me which man I was talking about, and when I turned around, there was no one there. I still remember what he looked like. He was a tall, thin man wearing an outdated old brown suit with a Dick Tracy-style brown hat. Thanks, Steve. Uh, this is a very interesting experience. It can have several different interpretations depending on who the man you saw was. Of course, there are always natural explanations, like you coincidentally feeling better, uh, perhaps being inspired by the confidence of the man in the hat. But I'll assume that something paranormal was happening here for purposes of discussion. It would be interesting to know when, meaning what decade, uh, this experience happened, because that could tell us how common or uncommon it would be that the man would be wearing an old-fashioned brown suit and Dick Tracy-style hat. But since you say that these clothing were outdated, I'll assume that it wasn't very common in this decade to see them. One possibility would be that the man who appeared was God or an angel. Another possibility is that it was the spirit of a deceased man who had lived back when such clothing was fashionable. Another possibility was that it was a living man who was old enough to be wearing outdated fashions. The fact that he vanished could be a sign that he was not actually a physical being, or it could just be that he stepped out of sight before you turned around. We've thus got a number of possibilities here. However, some humans are reported to have notable healing abilities. St. Paul even refers to people who were especially gifted with healing abilities in 1 Corinthians 12, and parapsychology has documented other individuals who seem to have healing abilities. So if living humans can have these abilities, then obviously God, angels, and the spirits of deceased humans would be expected to have them too. Our next experience comes from a listener named Peter. He writes, I was working at the Mayukwa refugee camp in western Zambia. This was back in 1989 when three civil wars were being waged on Zambia's border, Namibia, Angola, and Mozambique, and a fourth about to break out in Zaire. At the time, Mayukwa Yukwa was a small, very remote settlement of Angolan refugees of the Chokwe tribe, who sharpened their teeth. It was sufficiently remote that when I arrived, the children would rub my skin and then look at their fingers to see if my whiteness would rub off. I was talking with the village elders one day through my interpreter and asked them about the makishi that I would frequently see emerging from the woods. The makishi, dancers, apparently represent the spirits of dead ancestors coming to assist the boys in their initiation into manhood. The village elders explained that it had to do with a year-long rite circumcising and initiating boys into manhood. The final ceremony and celebration was tomorrow. I asked if I could attend, thinking it would be an interesting experience. The ensuing ice in the air made it abundantly clear that my request was profoundly inappropriate. I had my interpreter immediately apologize and withdraw the request. That night, as I was sitting on the cot in my little thatch hut, I heard a group of men chanting in the distance. I know that I was not asleep because I had just blown out the few candles I had to provide a bit of light. As I sat, the chanting voices started coming toward me. 
At first, I didn't think very much of it, but then it became clear that they were accelerating to a jogging pace. As they accelerated further to a running and then sprinting pace, I became alarmed. One cannot chant and sprint at the same time. These 20 or so voices were coming straight at me now, way faster than anyone could run. They continued to accelerate and whipped around my little hut at a ridiculous speed, and then they returned to the spot where they had begun decelerating and decrescendoing as they went. I continued sitting on my little cot, listening intensely and trying not to freak out. I then heard a few guys whispering outside, just on the other side of the thatch wall of my little hut, maybe five feet away. They began torturing an animal or something. It sounded like a pig screaming in a kind of a frenzied crescendo of pain, and then they shot it. The crack of the shot killed the night. Everything went quiet. I listened intently, but heard nothing more. The chirping bugs and other normal sounds of the nights started up again, and I eventually fell asleep without ever hearing the guys on the other side of the wall leave. When I got up in the morning, the village elders were at my door and invited me to come to the final ceremony of the circumcision and initiation of boys into manhood. Uh, Jimmy, what was that? Charlie McCarthy, it was not. When Peter says Charlie McCarthy, it was not, he's referring to a dummy that was used by the stage ventriloquist Edgar Bergen. So I assume he's saying that this experience did not involve ventriloquism or throwing your voice from one place to another. The Makishi that uh, Peter refers to are masked characters that represent ancestral spirits who come back to the world to help boys undergoing the circumcision manhood ritual of the Chukwe people. Uh, to understand them better and the ritual better, here's a brief backgrounder from UNESCO. And if you're watching the video version of the podcast, you'll be able to see the Makishi characters. The Makishi Masquerade is performed at the end of the Mukanda, an annual initiation ritual for boys between the ages of 8 and 12. This ritual is celebrated by the Vaka Chiyama Cha Mukwamayi communities, which include the Luvale, Chokwe, Luchazi, and Umbunda peoples who live in the northwestern and western provinces of Zambia. Usually at the beginning of the dry season, the young boys leave their homes and live for one to three months in an isolated bush camp. This separation from the outside world marks their symbolic death as children. The Mukanda has an educational function of transmitting practical survival skills, as well as knowledge about nature, sexuality, religious beliefs, and the social values of the community. In former times, it took place over a period of several months and represented the raison d'etre of the Makishi Masquerade. The Mukanda involves the circumcision of the initiates, tests of courage, and lessons on their future role as men and husbands. Each initiate is assigned a specific masked character, which remains with him throughout the entire process. The Chisaluke represents a powerful and wealthy man with spiritual influence. The Mupala is the lord of the Mukanda and protective spirit with supernatural abilities. Huevo is a female character representing the ideal woman and is responsible for the musical accompaniment of the rituals and dances. The Makishi is another masked character representing the spirit of a deceased ancestor who returns to the world of the living to assist the boys. The completion of the Mukanda is celebrated with a graduation ceremony. The entire village attends the Makishi dance and pantomime-like performance until the graduates re-emerge from the camp to reintegrate with their communities as adult men. Now, I'm aware of some very unusual paranormal experiences in tribal settings that anthropologists have reported. However, I've not heard about this particular type of experience. As always, the paranormal investigator's task is to make a list of possibilities, beginning with the natural ones. 
So in this experience, Peter is sitting in his thatched hut and has just blown out his candles. Presumably, uh, that would be obvious to any people outside as they could see the light go out through the cracks. So they would know that he's just settling down to go to sleep. He then starts hearing voices chanting in the distance, but it appears from the description that he's hearing the chanting in a particular direction, you know, not from all around him. The chanting then gets progressively louder, making it appear that the people are now sprinting towards him while chanting, even though it would be hard to chant and sprint at the same time. The voices then seem to whip around the hut faster than anyone could run, Peter says, and then they retreat into the distance again back the way they came. Afterwards, he hears people whispering outside the hut, maybe five feet away, he says, and then they seem to torture an animal, perhaps a pig, and the event is brought to a climax when a gunshot kills the animal. The normal forest noises return, and in the morning, the elders of the village invite him to attend the final part of the circumcision manhood ceremony, which it was inappropriate for him to ask for the previous day. Okay, the first thing to deal with here is how the voices seem to come at him and what, at what sounded like sprinting speed. Assuming this isn't paranormal, what could be responsible for this? Well, it would be easy to achieve that effect if the voices were on a recording device. Uh, you just position the recording device on one side of the hut and turn up the volume. When you turn it up rapidly, it sounds like the voices are coming at you rapidly. But we're talking about 1989 in a remote part of Africa where multiple wars were happening. So I think that the voices were not likely to be on a recording device. I think they were natural. In that case, there are two possibilities for how they seem to rush at the hut in this way. The first one is that the Chokwe have developed a technique for sprinting and chanting at the same time without the running affecting the sound of the chanting in a notable way. Or they simply did a human version of what we discussed with the option of turning up the volume on a recording device. They actually were close to the thatched hut on one side of it, and they started chanting softly and then rapidly turned up the volume of their voices, making it seem like they were getting closer rapidly. Now we have to explain how the voices seem to whip around the hut. And I agree here that ventriloquism was not involved. Uh, people often think of ventriloquism as throwing your voice, but it's not. You can't make your voice come from any other location besides your mouth. It's always coming from your mouth. That's where the sound's coming from. What ventriloquists like Edgar Bergen do is they use a dummy that's moving to suggest that the voice is really coming from the dummy because our brains associate sound and movement with each other. So you're not really throwing your voice. You're using a moving object and the power of suggestion. Only here... Peter can't see outside the hut, so there's no moving object. Instead, the sound alone appears to swing around the hut impossibly fast, faster than anyone could run, he says. Okay, taking that at face value, the obvious natural solution to me would seem to be multiple groups of chanters, with two or three groups of chanters positioned at different stations around the hut they could shift the chant between the different groups in a way that made it appear that there was a free-floating source of sound whipping around the hut impossibly fast and executing a U-turn. They then have the chanting appear to retreat back where it came from by having the original group of chanters on one side of the hut to start loud and then diminish the volume of their chanting until it fades out, making it sound like it's fading out with greater distance. The torture of the pig, or whatever, is straightforward. Uh, there were people, very likely the same people, who executed the audio U-turn standing five feet outside the hut. They then tortured an animal, quite possibly a pig, 
and then they shot it with a gun and killed it, perhaps as a form of sacrifice. Now, why did they do all of this, assuming this natural theory is true? The answer is found the next morning when they invite you to the closing ceremony. The previous day, when you asked if you could come, it was inappropriate because you weren't a member of their group. But now it's appropriate for you to come because now you're a member of their group, at least enough to attend the ceremony. So what happened the previous night was a ceremonial initiation. It made you a member of the group, at least enough to attend. And initiation ceremonies often involve difficult challenges. This is part of how humans bond and form social ties because you don't treat just anybody like an insider because random strangers can be freeloaders who will take advantage of you and then you know they take your resources, your time, your treasure, your talent, and then they leave when things get rough. Real allies, the kind of people you want as insiders, will bear hardship with you and reciprocate and help you out. The easiest way to ensure that someone is a real ally is to make them endure hardship in order to join the group. That's why initiation ceremonies are often hard. They involve waiting periods. They involve challenges. And they can involve things like fear. So I'd conjecture that the reason all this happened is that the Chukwe were trying to scare the hell out of you as part of an initiation rite so that you'd then be enough of an insider to attend the ceremony in keeping with your expressed desire. In fact, I would conjecture that what they did to you may have been part of what they did to the boys who were being initiated. At the beginning of their initiation, they take the boys off to a special camp and they circumcise them at the camp and then they... Um, put them through a whole bunch of other rites before bringing them back to the village. By going to the camp, the boys symbolically die as children, and then they're reborn into the community as adult men. Well, as a man, you need to face fear and hardship, so you can bet that what they put the boys through involves fear and hardship. So I'm guessing that one of the things they do to the boys at the camp may be exactly what they did to you. Noticed how practiced they seemed to be at doing it. This, this wasn't the first time they'd done this kind of thing. And the killing of the pig, in that case, likely was not only meant to scare you, it, was li- it would likely be meant as a substitute for you. Just like the boys have to symbolically die as children in order to become adult men and members of the community, so you too needed to symbolically die in the form of a pig and be reborn as enough of a member of the community to attend the celebration ceremony the next day. At least, that's what I'd guess based on my limited knowledge of the Chukwe. I'm sure that an anthropologist who studied them in depth would be able to say with much more confidence what was going on. Now, in this explanation, I haven't found the need to propose anything paranormal happening. Uh, That may be because I haven't picked up the needed clues from the description of the experience, and there may well have been something paranormal in this experience. I'm not excluding that, but based on at least my reading of the description, I haven't found anything that I think requires a paranormal explanation in this case. In any event, I hope my analysis is helpful. And this makes a nice spooky experience to close our show with today. Jimmy, is there anything else you'd like to say before we go? Uh, Just a reminder that we're always interested in hearing about your mysterious experiences, and we may use them in a future show. For example, the upcoming episode 350. And we've set up a special email that you can use to send your experiences to us so that we can keep track of them. Uh, So if you have an experience you'd like to report, you can send it to experience at mysterious.fm. Once again, that's experience at mysterious.fm. And be sure to use the experience email uh, address rather than the feedback address. And Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the viewers and listeners? We'll have links to the uh, Society for Psychical Research's two-volume work, Phantasms of the Living, 
Also, Mary Rose Barrington's book, Jot, When Things Disappear and Come Back or Relocate and Why It Happens. Tony Jinks's uh, book, Disappearing Object Phenomena, uh, links to Carl Jung's story of the scarab, John Paul II's motu proprio involving St. Bridget of Sweden, the Holy Office's warning about the so-called promises attributed to St. Bridget of Sweden, information about psychic cloud busting, uh, an article from aerospace.org, Did I See a Meteor or a Reentry?, and also the UNESCO video on the Makishi Masquerade. Very good. And now it's time to hear from you, our listeners. What are your theories about the amazing experiences we heard about today? You can let us know online by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Aikens Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And if you've had your own mysterious experience, you can let us know. You can send it to experience at mysterious.fm. Once again, that's experience at mysterious.fm. And I want to say a special thank you to uh, Melody Bettinelli and Isabella Bettinelli for their voice work in this episode. Also want to say thank you to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they did. Uh, You can check out the video version of the podcast by going to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And I am trying to grow my channel, and I'd appreciate your help if you're able to help us. That's actually, to help us grow it, that's actually very simple to do. If you like the video, if you comment on the video, and if you subscribe to the channel, that tells YouTube you found the video engaging and thus that other people might find it engaging too, so it will show it to more people. Um, And by the way, when you subscribe, be sure and hit the bell notification so that you always get notified whenever I have a new video, whether it's Mysterious World or one of the other videos I come out with every week. So Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we're going to be answering patrons' questions. So we're going to be talking about things like what mysterious experiences have you and I had, Dom? Also, why God made the dinosaurs, the Bronze Age collapse, the Holy House of Loretto, Foo Fighters, not the rock group, um, psychedelic drugs, Bob Lazar, and much more. Folks, be sure to get your very own Mysterious World t-shirt, mug, and more in our merchandise shop at sqpn.com slash merch. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 300. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by... The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. And by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs Matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. And by... Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.